like what is the argument by um, the plaintiffs in these cases that uh, it really has nothing to do? A lot of times you get uh, uh, cases like this that are here the EPA has set certain standards and you have not met them. And it's almost like they're working as like private sheriffs uh, using the existing law to sue someone for non-compliance with that law. In fact, there's a antitrust lawsuit from Gannett to Google that is they're, they're just suing them under antitrust laws. You know, uh, you could do theoretically the same thing if the EPA has said this is above or below a certain limits that that these cases don't hinge on that. They just hinge on you've put out a product that, you know, is harmful. But are, is there an attempt to sort of like question whether the EPA can do that? Because once the EPA sort of has that finding, too, it's going to increase the liability, it seems to me, of these companies that did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, really good questions. Um, I know that the manufacturers of PFAS who have been you know liable for all this stuff and who are defendants in this case that I wrote about did sue the EPA or attempted to sue the EPA when they proposed new drinking water limits and when they proposed the um, Superfund designation. And that case was thrown out by a judge, but I don't remember what the argument was there. Um, the defense in this multi-district litigation that the um, PFAS manufacturers have put out, they've tried several defenses. One of them was the government contractor immunity defense that um, they shouldn't be liable for any harm because they developed uh, this firefighting foam with PFAS as its main ingredient at the request of the government. They were contractors. Um, and so it's actually the government, the, you know, the military that should be held responsible for the damage it caused. Um, the federal judge overseeing this case threw that out, well, didn't throw that out, but said that the case should not be thrown out for that reason. Um, the defendants can still argue that at trial if a trial occurs. Uh, but they said basically that the manufacturers had the information about the harms of this product and they didn't share it with their main customer, the government. And so you can't be responsible for the harm if you're not aware of it. Um, someone uh, from the Naval Research Center said that the, um, you know, that he himself and the people in the Navy didn't know um, what the main ingredient of this firefighting foam was because uh, the manufacturers had claimed, um, you know, that it was a, a trade secret, basically. Right. Yeah, they want to uh, they want to blame it on the government for putting it in there, but they also want to maintain any ability to make profits off it. Um, right. What give us a sense of like how ubiquitous. Because when I first heard about firefighter foam, I'm like, that, that sounds like a very narrow uh, case. But when you start to add up all of the places where this firefighting foam is deployed, just even on like, you know, you got to practice with it and you it does not dissipate. So every tiny drop you put in sort of travels like, I don't know, almost like a, like a dollar bill you put into the economy. It goes all over the place, over the court, and, except for different with the dollar bill is it ultimately tears or it gets burnt by the, uh, the treasury. This does not go away. <laughs> right. Firefighting foam sounds a little bit random or niche, but um, it, it's important because of the, just the sheer quantity of it that's used um, for many decades. Um, the military used it at every single military installation to have on hand in case there was a fire. It's uh, this particular type of firefighting foam that's meant for jet fuel, you know, gasoline based fires. It does a really good job of just like smothering the fire very quickly. And it's used by just spraying like many, many, many gallons at a thing. So you picture like engulfing an entire jet or an airplane or a car that's on fire. And so every military installation had this stuff on hand, every airport, you know, the AFFF, um, th this foam was just absolutely everywhere. Local fire houses had it. Um, and they were not only using it to put out fires, but like you said, for, for training and the stuff is just, it's foam. It flies away. It's liquid. It goes into the 
uh, the soil or the groundwater near an airport or a military base of any kind or a firehouse, they, they find it, this stuff, and it, it just, it sticks around and it only, people have only stopped using this stuff like this year. It's just been used for so, so long. And so that's what this case is about. It's, it's about PFAS, but it's using the firefighting foam to sort of focus it. Um, what's really uh, was amazing about the, you know, like, again, like I've heard this story before, but you, you cover how in 1975, as early as 1975, there were scientists who, uh, found this new chemical in mm -hmm. blood samples. And that's also, even the idea of finding a new chemical is pretty extraordinary because it's very hard to find a chemical when you're not looking for it and you right. can't look for a chemical if you don't know what it is. Right. Uh, they must have just stumbled on something by chance that the other things that they were testing for in that blood sample flagged something else there, which rarely, rarely happens, uh, which is, of course, also like you don't know if it's in your water if you're not testing for that. When, exactly. when, you, when people get their water tested, they have no reason to test for a PFOB because they may not even know it exists. Um, and so they reached out to 3M in 1975 to help identify it. Was that a coincidence or like, I mean, was it just that like they had reason to believe that 3M was developing it or what? That, I don't know why they reached out to 3M right away or if they reached out to other chemical manufacturers as well. Um, I think 3M was just, you know, one of the, the big chemical manufacturers in the game at the time. And so they thought, you know, if, if anybody's going to be developing some new novel man-made weirdo chemical that <laughs> we've never seen before, maybe it's them. And so, yeah, they, they, uh, they called up 3M and said, we, we found this strange compound. We're very curious about it. Is this something that you are working on? And, um, internal memos from 3M throw, show that whoever answered the phone said, huh, that's, very interesting. Let me pass that up, pass that up the chain. Um, and, and it only took 25 <laughs> years, literally 25 years or 23 years for them to reveal to the EPA that, um, that PFAS were in the blood of the general population. Like everybody, more than likely, every single person listening to us right now yeah, has some sure. PFAS in them because it has gotten in there through their water through their food, um, through maybe, I, I don't like maybe the air, is it possible to, for it to come through the air or yes. is it something that you have to ingest? Ingestion is the, the main way that people get it in their bodies, but it is also in the air um, when things are incinerated and it goes up into the air and then falls down onto the soil. It's a so, whole, it's a whole life cycle. I mean, yeah, are, newborn babies are born with PFAS in their blood as well. This is a multi-district litigation, which means that this uh, litigation has happened in different uh, districts around the, and it's been combined in one uh, court case in, I think it's Georgia. Is that right? In, y yes, it, the main plaintiff for this first part of it was in um, Stewart, Florida, but it's being argued in South Carolina. Just South that. Carolina. Right. Yeah. And, um, and in fact, I think it is like Papantonio's firm that is representing Stewart, Florida, hmm. uh, or at least, uh, some of them, but there's a bunch of other plaintiffs who are the defendants. And, in and, 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 and when the city gets paid for it, like, what is the idea that the cities or the municipalities or the counties or whoever these jurisdictions are looking for when they get paid out, what are they looking for? They're looking for money to help them treat the water. Um, because, and it's sort of been spurred on by recent EPA, um, new regulations as the EPA is, is going to start limiting how much PFAS are allowed in drinking water, public water authorities then have to pay for that. They have to pay for the treatment of their water for their customers. And so that's sort of inspired a lot of, um, water authorities, cities, counties, entire states. I mean, there's like 15 states also suing um, in this case. So the first part of the case was focused on um, water water authorities. 
and then there are going to be subsequent parts of the case where the it'll be um, uh, individual like property damage, you know, people whose um, personal wells have been contaminated. There's um, people who have gotten sick from expo, you know, who they believe that they've gotten sick from exposure to PFAS. There's firefighters who have worked with this stuff, veterans who have worked with this stuff, who you know believe they have gotten sick because of it. So there's going to be, you know, personal injury lawsuits. It's going to be a very long, long process. And I was just writing about this first process, just about um, water authorities. But you had asked what the who the defendants were. The defendants are 3M, DuPont, um, Camores, which Camores is a spinoff company that came from DuPont originally. When they tried and, to get out of, I think, the 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 last um, um, uh, penalty that in, in, in that C8 case. Yes. Yes. So DuPont now says, you know, we don't manufacture PFAS because Camores does. Um, but uh, then there's also all these like other smaller companies that manufacture firefighting foam companies you probably haven't heard of, but that have made the foam for decades using the ingredients developed by 3M DuPont. Well, it's a fascinating case. Great story. Uh, folks can check it out at Consumer Reports. We're going to put a link at uh, the YouTube and podcast. Lauren, great to see you again. Uh, doing great work at uh, Consumer Reports. Really appreciate uh, uh, you coming on today and talking to us about it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Send us your next story. Okay. See I'll you come again. back anytime. All right. Thanks.